Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hey everyone, it's Mickey here. You're listening to Wikipedia, and this week on the podcast. I speak to one of the original gangsters in the nutrition space, Alan Aragon, all about the science of flexible dieting. To say that he's been around a long while would be an absolute understatement. And this isn't said in reflection of his age, more the years that he has spent creating and sharing nutrition content, both in the gym and fitness space, but also of course in the academic space. In this interview, we speak on a range of different topics, including his background in training and nutrition, and of course, his book, Flexible Dieting, which is written for anyone wanting to optimize their body composition. We speak on a range of different concepts of weight loss, including his method of figuring out energy requirements for fat loss, his protein recommendations, how to track calories in a way that doesn't drive someone absolutely mental, how to calorie cycle appropriately to still enjoy the good things in life, and what safe weight loss is, and much, much more than that. So anyone who has an interest in physique, science, and body composition, fat loss and weight loss, you will get so much from this conversation. So Alan Aragon is a nutrition researcher and educator with over 30 years of success in the field. He is known as one of the most influential figures in the fitness industry's movement towards evidence-based information. His notable clients include Stone Cold Steve Austin, Derek Fisher, and Pete Sampras. Alan writes a monthly research review, I highly recommend it, providing cutting-edge theoretical and practical information. Alan's work has been published in popular magazines as well as the peer-reviewed scientific literature, and we've included a list of his publications in the show notes. He co-authored Nutrient Timing Revisited, the most viewed article in the history of the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. He is also the lead author of the ISCCN position stand on diets and body composition, and we talk about that in today's interview. Alan maintains a private practice designing programs for recreational and professional athletes, and of course regular people striving to be their best. So we have got the contact information for Alan in the show notes, as well as a link to his book, Flexible Dieting, which I can't recommend enough. Just before we crack on into the interview, just to like to remind you that we are launching mini Wikipedias on a Monday, where I have some short form solo and conversations with experts released on a Monday. These will be short, 15 to 20 ish minutes, just discussing one particular topic at a time based on feedback that you guys actually want a little more of my nutrition content thrown in Wikipedia as well, which I'm more than happy to do. You guys know I love to talk. So um, they that is being launched early 2023. And uh, I'd also like to remind you that the best way to support the podcast is to hit subscribe wherever you listen to Wikipedia, and that way it increases the visibility of us to other people who are interested in this health and wellness field. There are thousands of podcasts out there, so the fact that you listen just blows me away, and to have more people discovering us would just be amazing. So thank you so much for doing that. All right, team. For now, enjoy the conversation that I have with Dr. Alan Aragon. Alan Aragon, thank you so much for joining me in your afternoon. I'm so thrilled to be able to chat to you, and I have been following you for what seems like forever, uh, which is unsurprising given you're about 30 years in the industry as a researcher and and a clinician. Um, Can we kick off by you giving us a little bit of your backstory for people who might be a little bit unfamiliar 
I understand you could have gone an artistic sort of musical path once upon a time before <laughs> heading into the nutrition right. space. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast, Mickey. It's really a pleasure to be here. So thank you for that. And uh, for the listeners who are unfamiliar with me, most of the nutrition guidelines for personal trainers and sports dietitians uh, in kind of the current era is based on research by my colleagues and I. And so really like for the past decade or so, we've been forming the foundation for what I would call brotacular uh, practice guidelines for um, recreational and competitive athletes who want to either improve body composition or athletic performance. And so my life as of the past decade has been mainly involved in, in research. So the reviewing side as well as the, the publishing side. And then prior to that, as you mentioned, Mickey, uh, my school journey started off in art and then ended up in nutrition. <laughs> uh, I just have a, a, a wide range of, of interests and I chose the I don't know. I chose the sciency route. And um, I was a personal trainer for the first decade of my career and a nutritional counselor for the second decade. And then for the third decade, it's been research and education and trying to relay what I've learned um, throughout those decades to the, to the professionals as well as the, the lay audience. So that's the journey thus far. Yeah, and Alan, you so you've got um, a nice mix of the research and the the sort of practical element because, of course, mm -hmm. not everything that you read in a paper is directly sort of translatable to the person that you might be working with or you would have been working with in the past. So, do you ever get any pushback in that sort of research space when you highlight the fact that yeah, that might be a you know significant finding here, but what does it really mean for the person? Yeah, I, I do get some pushback on occasion. And um, it's it's hard to convey nuance a lot of times on social media in, in a world of sound bites. And also, even in the research world, it's hard to... It's hard to mesh the, the theoretical stuff with, with the real world stuff because... In the research world, we're really trying to nitpick over what's optimal, but then that ends up being this really small margin that matters maybe just a few percent in the big picture. And um, sometimes it's easy to stray away from what's reliable and what, what works and what's sustainable. And there's a bunch of examples in that area in, in like just... Uh, meal timing and distribution for, for various goals. I mean, we're looking at just, you know, different ways of smearing around the icing on the cake when it is, you know, really just the icing on the cake. So. Yeah. So interesting. And, and of course, you know, with your experience and background, you've got a range of uh, sort of publications out there that people can go and source in your most recent book on flexible dieting which of course we're going to dive into today um it brilliantly sort of like lays all of those uh, probably the nuance puts a nuance into the research sort of space or side of it um alan where before we get onto that just out of interest where do you think most interpretation or misinterpretation happens in the nutrition space is it are there are things that you see time and again that you're like how are we still getting this wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of it has to do, well, currently what I'm, I'm kind of embroiled in now is the idea that there is some universally superior meal pattern or meal distribution, meal frequency um, through the day or through the week to either achieve good health or good good body composition or both. And uh, it just kind of blows my mind how um, how people with, with big platforms are pushing the idea that 
everybody needs to intermittent fast or everybody needs to stop eating after 5 30 p.m pacific standard time or <laughs> or everybody needs to make sure their feeding window is no longer than eight hours because then you're going to disrupt your circadian rhythms and and then live a horrible life and go down a dark path of, of demise and it's like um, no, not really, man. <laughs> so yeah. It just kind of blows my mind when, when people are touting these things as universal superiority. And it's like, mm, well, um, the evidence just does not point to that. Yeah. And where, where does that misinterpretation come from? So what are these people relying on to sort of make the claims? And of course, I've heard the claims in, in, in previous years. I've also thought that to be the case, but then mm. have evolved my thinking after listening to people like you and, and others in the space talk more reasonably on it, I suppose. But why are people saying things like that? I think there's a lack of contextualizing things, con contextualizing mm. claims. And when you combine that with the kind of the, the momentum that gets started by acute effect or, or short-term effect research that shows promise yeah. in, in one particular direction, then people tend to blow it out of proportion and make the generalization that, okay, well, these findings must be true if you drag the study out for several weeks or even a few months. And mm -hmm. in in the in the case of um, intermittent fasting, um, and within that umbrella of intermittent fasting, we're really looking at time restricted feeding. And within that, we're <laughs> looking at early time restricted feeding versus delayed. Uh, time restricted feeding, and so the darling now of uh, uh, I, uh, you know if I if I were to not um, sugarcoat my language, the the darling mm -hmm. of the health and longevity zealots is um, early time restricted feeding, and this is based on uh, a handful of acute effect trials showing um, improved glycemic control and insulin sensitivity when your food intake is shifted towards the earlier part of the day as opposed to the later part of the day. And this finding has been pretty consistent in trials lasting 24 hours all the way up to a few weeks. However, uh, this finding just recently was seen to be washed out over, over the long term. And this is in the first 12-month trial directly comparing um, early time restricted feeding with a conventional 12 hour, you know, just 12 hour distribution. So, so, uh, um, eating from eight to four versus basically eating from eight to eight, but both conditions were hypocaloric and there was no difference in improvement of body weight and body comp between the groups. And there was no difference in improvement in a range of, um, blood biomarkers of health including the insulin sensitivity and glucose control advantages that we see in the short term and early time restricted feeding studies. And uh, there's another study showing null results on this as well, but then the experiment is dragged out for several weeks and there are some conflicting studies within that realm. But when you take a step back and look at the big picture and tell people that, hey, it's optimal to just skip dinner and your life is going to be all better. Your health is going to be all better. Just don't eat dinner. It starts to get pretty unrealistic since, um, since pretty much the dawn of human history, we've been eating dinner. Um, it's just that there are other lifestyle factors that got introduced into the modern lifestyle that uh, we are ignoring and we're kind of nitpicking at things like placement of the meal window, length of the feeding window, um, that is really taking our eyes off what really matters. And so, yeah, that's there, there's a mix of things, Mickey, that lead to this misinterpretation and these wild claims that happen. Yeah, and I imagine, Alan, given your sort of professional experience as a personal trainer back in the day as well, and, and a lot of your work has been done looking in that sort of physique space, you must have been surrounded by um, these kind of misinterpretations or the lack of nuance um, or sort of myopic thinking in the nutrition space, I can imagine. 
Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. It, there's a whole battery of stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it, even going in the opposite direction too. Like whereas the current climate is to concentrate your feeding window into as short of a time period as possible. Back in the '90s and early 2000s, it was all about spreading it out. It was about the the nibbling pattern instead of the gorging pattern. But over time, we we came to see that tightly controlled metabolic ward and um, metabolic chamber conditions, and you know, no no metabolic advantage to the uh, stoking the metabolic fire with a nibbling pattern versus a gorging pattern uh, when you're comparing identical um, diets in terms of calories and macronutrition. So um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of mythology that, that is perpetual. Yeah. And actually, this is a slight tangent, to be honest, Alan, but I was thinking about one pattern of eating, which was really popular here. Well, in, in our space for the late 90s, early 2000s, Bill Phillips, Body for Life. Mm, yeah, and his yeah. he had quite a. I would say he had looking at what his recommendations were back then. They're actually not too different from maybe best practice recommendations. Now you know you have a <laughs> sort of an equal number of um, sort of protein to, to carb, a little bit of fat. You do a little bit of training. You have a, a day where you may relax everything off again, and then you sort of tighten <laughs> right. up again for the week. Like I think he was onto something. You know what? I bought I bought that book, Body for Life, and I was a big fan of of Bill Phillips. And I, you know, I actually I, I'm still a fan of how he brought awareness of the fitness and and you know bodybuilding, lifting lifestyle to the mainstream. He was instrumental in that, and that was really cool. Even like his first his his. He did a couple of documentaries. If you might remember, he did Body of Work first and then Body for Life. Oh, and he was the first guy to do the transformation contest on a mass scale in an ingenious way to sell his products. <laughs> yeah. I, it, was, it was awesome. <laughs> um, Eat three solid meals and have three of the shakes and then do fasted cardio because, you know, and all of that stuff. And But, you know, to, to Bill's credit... If he didn't come out with and, and really push the fasted cardio angle, um, I don't think my colleagues and I would have ran a trial testing the fasted cardio question. So Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, interesting, Alan. And, and very briefly, just because you mentioned it, mm -hmm. what is the state of the science on fasted cardio then? Just because yeah. people will want to know since you brought it up. Mm -hmm. There is a... Systematic review and meta-analysis done um, after the trial that we did. It's by Daniel Hackett and Amanda Hagstrom. And um, they took a look at all the research in this area. And sure enough, they concluded the same thing my colleagues and I did when we ran what uh, it kind of incredibly is the first and only controlled hypocaloric trial on fasted versus fed cardio. So we, we did this trial in 2014 or 2015. It's all a blur now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, myself, uh, Brad Schoenfeld et al., uh, we ran this trial. It was a four-week trial testing, um, and this was in um, college-age women, we measured the effects of fed aerobic exercise at a moderate intensity for roughly 45-ish minutes um, versus uh, fasted cardio. So fed cardio versus fasted cardio, we were able to control that pretty tightly by using a meal replacement packet type of product. And uh, we, we just compared body composition between the fasted cardio group and the fed cardio group. And um, we made sure that their diets in total were as close to identical as possible. And we also made sure that they were consuming ample optimized protein level, 1.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. And this is actually one of these studies where I actually individualized each of the diets for um, each of the subjects. And we, we ran the trial very anticlimactically, we found no difference in body composition improvements as a result of fed versus fasted cardio. And um, all of the subjects 
preserved their lean body mass. So lean body mass did not change, but body fat significantly decreased in both groups to a similar degree. So we didn't see any advantage or magic to fasted cardio. And like I said, amazingly, no one else has done a controlled hypocaloric study, you know, investigating that question. So um, for what we can say for the time being is that whether you do your cardio fed or whether you do it fasted, it really should be left to personal preference. Some people do a lot better by doing their cardio just first thing in the morning with nothing in their stomach and you'll be just fine. Some people prefer to not ever do cardio fasted and they'll be just fine. And while it is true that you do oxidize or in quotes, burn more fat during fasted cardio, you actually burn more fat during the rest of the day when you do fed cardio, if both conditions are equated in terms of total dietary intake. Yeah, so uh, it all comes out even at 24 yeah. hours. So, so yeah, that was, um, that was the thing. And, and, you know, and, and in hindsight, it would have been actually kind of cool if we discovered some sort of magic with fasted cardio, because then we would have found something really, um, kind of unexpected, something, against the the hypothesis <laughs> but we didn't we didn't find it so well it's interesting you say that alan because i feel like anytime anyone uh sort of uh talks about nutrition or and uh, you know or factors that might improve body composition we're always looking for that magic hack aren't we we're always looking for the sort of one thing that is is going to sort of supersede everything else when it comes to uh importance and of course there is one thing when it comes to body composition, potentially, you know, a calorie deficit um, is, mm -hmm. is one of those things, but it mm -hmm. certainly doesn't sell the same way that eat everything within a six hour window or do all of your training sort of fasted. It doesn't really sell the same possibly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it's just not exciting enough. <laughs> it's not special yeah. enough yeah, yeah. when, when people no. have a lot of options and, a wide range of variations of, of protocols leading up to the same result. It's kind of boring to hear that, you know, we want, we want to know what the thing is. Yeah. But actually it's quite um, encouraging for people to appreciate that there are many paths to roam. You know, there are many ways with which you can slice and dice to sort of get to where you want to be. And therefore they can sort of find what really does sort of work for them. And, you know, your book, Flexible Dieting, might very well offer up a lot of the really important elements with which can be included in there to help people reach their goals, right? But can I ask you, Alan, like, when we're, really basically, your book is about flexible dieting, but how does that differ from just dieting and, and counting macros? Yes, it, it differs in a definitional sense, I think, mainly, because flexible dieting, its first appearance in print was in the early 1990s in, in the peer-reviewed literature, where different styles of dietary restraint were compared. So flexible dieting is actually a cognitive style of dietary restraint. And so what was compared in the literature was flexible restraint versus rigid restraint. And it was also called flexible dietary control versus rigid dietary control. So rigid dietary control was a perception of dieting and a perception of foods as good or bad, black or white, all or nothing. And it was a dichotomous view of foods and dieting. Whereas flexible dieting uh, took a more relativistic view and took a little bit more of a shades of gray type of view of dieting. There's no such thing as absolute good foods and absolute evil foods. Um, if you have a margin of uh, indulgences, um, that's fine. You can still have an overall healthy diet. Um, if you fall off the wagon, no big deal. Just get back on. This is not an all or nothing endeavor. Uh, whereas with rigid dieting, it was pretty much the opposite of that good and bad foods, you know, all or nothing. And those different approaches, flexible dietary control versus rigid dietary control were compared 
over the course of several studies and um, flexible dietary control uh, unanimously showed more favorable outcomes with regard to both body weight, weight control, weight loss maintenance, and, and mood states, and um, proclivity towards uh, developing eating disorders. So, so there's an association with rigid dieting. There's more of a, a positive correlation with rigid dieting and disordered or dysfunctional eating when you compare that to a non-dichotomous view of foods and dieting, which is the flexible dieting paradigm. So when you look at it from that standpoint of flexible dieting being a style, a cognitive style of dietary restraint, it kind of has nothing to do with counting macros. And in fact, counting macros can actually, I mean, if it can be taken to a pathological level where it can be a rigid thing, where you're micromanaging and you're almost fostering this sort of neurosis over very tiny units and trying to, uh, trying to, I guess, maybe over, over micromanage your life. So there's a line there. And, but what happened as it happened sometimes in like when fitness culture, um, here's a buzzword like flexible dieting and they, the people within the culture just kind of adopt it and assign that label to macro counting because after all, the flexibility in macro counting is in your food selection. So there is a, a degree of liberation there compared to other approaches that really are <laughs> persnickety about how they dictate your food selection. But um, macro counting kind of didn't care what, what your food selection was as long as you hit your macros. So macro counting is kind of a double-edged sword in terms of flexible dieting. Flexible, yes, in terms of food selection, but rigid in terms of its precision and its its emphasis on quantification of these um, small units, these targets that you need to hit. And so, yeah, it is a double-edged sword. But at the risk of complicating all of this, real flexible dieting, a truly flexible dieting approach would accommodate different degrees of rigidity. So under the umbrella of flexible dieting, according to the individual's personal preference and goals, it's perfectly fine for some people to fall on the more rigid and more quantitative and more precise side of the spectrum, like people who count macros. Uh, and it would also encompass people on the far other side of the spectrum who take a more qualitative and habits-based, non-quantitative approach to to foods and, and, and to dieting. So flexible dieting and can, can also encompass people who do those different things on different points in the spectrum seasonally. And so that's real flexible dieting is flexibility of the dietary approach. Do you feel like people need to be experienced in order to uh, feel comfortable in that flexible, flexible space? Do you know what I mean? Like that they, they mm -hmm. may have already had uh, years of experience of counting macros, therefore, but might be over it. And this style of flexible dieting sort of allows them to use those skills, but more intuitively. Yes. Yes, I, I, I agree that that is true. I think that it can help most people to have an awareness of the calorie and, and macronutrient values of the foods that they consume in the portions that they consume them. So I, I think it it can help people that that level of awareness can help people. Um, it's just interesting how there's different ways to build that awareness and it doesn't have to be down to the gram. So yeah, when I, I went through my nutrition undergrad and then my graduate degree in nutrition, um, obviously they, they taught us the portion system. So or the diabetic exchange system as it, as it were. And so it was all about assigning portions across the food groups in order for people to not only hit their uh, macronutrition targets, but also their micronutrition targets and the targets in terms of the balance across the food groups to get the full spectrum of 
of nutrition that these diverse different types of foods had to offer. And so after having learned that and after having learned to basically prescribe portions from, you know, every one of the food groups to equal um, the targeted amount of protein, carbohydrates and fats across the right balance of foods within and across the groups, it seemed to be a step down when people were just dishing out macronutrient targets. I almost, it, it almost uh, struck me as, oh, well, we're kind of taking a step down now because now people are pretty much ignoring food groups and the tr in unique nutritional value of each food group. And so we've sort of stepped away from diet quality as we try to just quantify grams. And, and so I think, yes, there's value in knowing the calories and macronutrient grams of the foods in the portions that you have them. But I think that there's also a lot of value in knowing or, or learning how to achieve a nutritionally well-balanced diet in terms of covering the spectrum across the food groups and even diversity within the food groups to just optimize the diet in, in terms of its potential for keeping you healthy. Yeah, it's interesting, Ellen, you say that because I've been a practitioner for over 20 years and it hasn't been until the last three or four where I've actually started thinking about calories the way that I see almost everyone on social media who are like, oh, I'll give you your macro targets. And and this is, it's actually a relatively new thing for me as a practitioner to use them maybe 30% of the time with my clients because prior to that, like you, I also worked in food groups and that's how I learned about nutrition and and quote-unquote balance. And and as practitioners, it's, it's not hard for me to look at an individual's diet and know that merely not even thinking about calories, but making food swaps by default, the calories are going to come down and the nutrition value is going to come up. Um, yes. But I, I feel like because more and more people are out there talking about macros, there's almost more demand from the the people who are coming to see me to also, you know, they think oh, I want to know what my macros need to be. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas maybe 10 years ago, they might not have been so aware that that, that was a thing that they even need to think about. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's, it's just a, a higher degree of precision in terms of um, quantifying every little thing, which can be good or bad, depending on who you are. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, so, Alan, if we do actually talk about calories now and sort of creating a deficit to improve body composition, you do it in a different way to 95% of the people that I've, you know, that I see and, and I've previously used to sort of calculate the number of calories someone might need to sort of hit in order to lose weight. So mm -hmm. can you just sort of describe how you came about your method for doing it? Because actually, intuitively, when I heard about it, it just made so much more sense to me, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, um, it's always a challenge to explain these things without complicating it, but I'm going to try. Okay, so there are a lot of people in the general public who kind of have no idea what maintains them in terms of caloric intake they have no idea so um there there are a couple ways you can go about this you can uh, find out the theoretical amount or you can find out what you think is the actual amount so if we start off with um trying to find out what the actual amount is then you can do a standard routine of having somebody journal everything they eat for a week and then average those calories per day. And if they happen to be maintaining, then there you have your maintenance calories. But the yeah. problem with that is that we, we've got to remember that when people start journaling, they subconsciously make healthier choices, make a little bit more Spartan <laughs> choices, especially if they have to be accountable to themselves or somebody else about what they eat and their their week week long journal may be skewed a bit down a bit downward in in terms of total calories that they 
actually eat because they might not have that extra dessert uh, after the meal or they might not have that extra drink before the meal if they have to write it down. So um, to make a, a long story short, if you are aware, if you, if you have a really good handle on the amount of calories that maintains you, then all you need to do is make a decision of how you are going to alter energy balance if your goal calls for that. So if you know that, for example, 2,000 calories, you consume 2,000 calories, and you know it's maintaining you, but you know that you want to lose weight, let's say, then you have to make the decision about how you're going to impose hypocaloric conditions. Are you going to do that with an increase in energy expenditure? Are you going to do that with a decrease in energy intake? Or is it going to be some combination of both? And so um, people vary in their, uh, in their decision of how to program that. And so now let's take some, someone else who eats very haphazardly, has no idea what their maintenance caloric requirement is. And even if you were to have them journal what they eat for a week, it's, um, there's, there's very little chance that they're going to do an, make an accurate uh, account of, of what they eat or know what they're doing in terms of recording in the first place. Well, then for this person, it would actually help for them to know what theoretically would maintain them at, well, not just their, their current body weight, but at their goal body weight. And not only that, but what would maintain their goal body weight at a given physical activity level? Because then you have the maintenance requirements for your, your goals, the maintenance caloric requirements for your goals. And then, you know, there, sometimes there's a big gap between what those requirements are and what you're currently doing. And sometimes there really isn't. But um, I think it helps people to know if they want to make substantial changes in body composition, it helps to have that theoretical number of, of what you need to consume in order to, I guess, transform into the, that, that future self that you want to be. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, figuring out the maintenance requirements of the goal person or the, the goal physique, I think that can be useful too. So, so those are the two tracks. You either are aware of what maintains you and you adjust up or down, or you kind of have no clue and it helps to know the theoretical caloric requirements of this person you want to become. Yeah, because often what people do is they go to the online calculators and they then say, I want to you know, lose seven kilos or something like that. And then the calculator will determine what those calories will be in order for you to sort of shift that weight. Whereas the way that you do it, you are putting in like, I want to maintain my weight at 73 kilos, despite the fact that currently I might be, you know, 80. Mm -hmm. So that's, yes. that's the difference, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. So it is a, it, it's kind of a different way to, to look at it. But um, sometimes when people find out what their theoretical calorie need is and they go, oh, well, and it's, let's imagine it's for a weight loss goal and they go, oh, well, that's, that's higher than what I'm consuming right now. Um, my first thought is, mm, how accurate is your perception of what you're consuming? And then my second thought is, well, gosh, if you know what's maintaining you right now, then you don't need some calculator to take a educated guess at what you need. So yeah, just yeah. scrap the the online calculator. You already know. So let's work yeah. from there and make a decision about how to impact and and sort of disrupt <laughs> that energy balance to make some changes. Yeah. How accurate in your view are the online calculators that are available out there for helping someone determine this, Alan? They are, you know, they're pretty good in terms of just theoreticals. They're all pretty, they're all pretty decent. Uh, what the common thread is for most of them for weight loss people is that um, they spit out numbers that, that people feel are too high. 
So they they spit out um, prescriptions that dieters go, oh, I could never lose weight on that. And, <laughs> you know, and, and so that's very common with, you know, with the the NIH, with Kevin Hall's, um, uh, gosh, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the nickname of that. Um, and with, with various calculators out there. But the reality of the matter is people tend to uh, overestimate how much they're actually eating. And, um, or actually they tend to under-report what they, they're actually eating. And so um, that's, that's kind of the problem. Some people who think that they're consuming, let's say 16 or 1800 calories, a lot of the time are actually consuming 22 to 2500 calories. And so getting that perception right is, is kind of a challenge. Yeah. And I think there's real value actually in if this is an important goal for people, and I don't know how you feel about this, but actually it is valuable to take maybe a couple of weeks to actually track and measure as closely as you can what you are eating. So you are weighing portions of food. So you you appreciate that, you know, you're thinking you're having five grams of peanut butter, but you're having 25 grams of peanut butter. You know, and and the caloric difference there is, you know, a few hundred calories, and that that stuff adds up. The same with things like mayonnaise, yeah. with butter, with the really sort of energy dense foods. And I wonder whether that's an area, or at least clinically speaking, that's what I see. That's an area which a lot of people sort of forget about. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a reality that people need to be aware of. Uh, I I think that. Um, certain pieces of research are, are really pivotal in our understanding of, of this sort of misestimation of intake, like um, Licht, Lichtman and colleagues, I think it's 1993-ish. Uh, the, the subjects were, um, they were obese subjects with a claimed history of diet resistance and also a claimed history of consuming 1,200 calories a day. And in reality, what happened was they, they were consuming about a thousand calories more than that at, at minimum. So they were underestimating, they were, they were over uh, reporting their physical activity by 50 ish percent. I think it was 51%. And they were um, under reporting their caloric intake by mid 40%. And, and so the, the, the margin of unaccounted or misreported calories ended up being like 1300 ish calories. And so, um, this was a really eye opening result, especially when they measured resting metabolic rate and everyone was in 10% within 10% of predicted resting metabolic rate values for the person's body size. And, and so, so yeah, at, at, at worst, um, there was a like nine or 10% lower resting metabolic rate than what would be predicted for normal, healthy individuals of that weight. Yeah. So you can't, you, you couldn't put any of that down to weight loss resistance, slow metabolism. There's nothing that we can do here, which I actually think is yeah. quite a good message for people to appreciate. Because if you mm -hmm. are in the camp of thinking that you, of, you haven't previously sort of tracked anything, yet you're like, it seems like nothing I ever do actually works, then some of what you've just described with that study it's and i've seen that sort of repeated in, in other trials sort of subsequent you know in subsequent years um that might be more of an explanatory sort of factor which means that the ability to change that is actually quite simple not necessarily easy but it's quite simple to, for people to do yes and i think in, in the vein of of altering energy balance sometimes just eating less progressively and continually it really won't work it doesn't work because um it's tough on people psychologically and you can only sustain a, a degree of a certain degree of misery for so long before you just say all right i quit and so sometimes the the focus does need to be lifted off of weight loss 
And when the focus is lifted off weight loss, it gives the the mind a break from the 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 grind of dieting and restricting. And so if we can think of of ways to make dieters feel like they're not restricting, then um, we can begin to get through to some folks who are in quotes diet resistant, diet resistant, because really what they are is they're just psychologically fatigued with the process of dieting. And uh, there's an interesting study by Clark in like 2015 or 2017 ish, where he did take the emphasis off of weight loss and the subjects were instructed to not step on the scale and not think of scale weight, but they were assigned a hypocaloric diet, uh, but they were also assigned um, certain goals for improving um, exercise, um, endurance and strength in various activities. So their focus was on improving fitness, improving exercise performance. And so with those type of goals and with the emphasis being completely lifted off of scale weight, they actually lost a substantial amount of body weight. I think it was 15 to 30% across the group, which is, which is tremendous actually in, in weight loss trials, no matter how long (laughs) the trial you're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And that really speaks to your, what your earlier comments in and around that, that flexible sort of mindset rather than that sort of really, I mean, it, it's different, but similar in that you, you're not th- constantly thinking about restraint instead. I mean, yes, you might be in a, um, a calorie deficit approach, but instead changing that focus to what you can achieve elsewhere. Like what a difference. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That it doesn't, the flexibility approach applies to what you're focusing on for the goal. Um, and it, it doesn't just apply to, you know, food selection or the type of diet you're going to go on. And, um, and by the way, th- this study that I talked about Clark and colleagues, uh, if you want, if you want to check it out, it's, it's really quite a really cool study. So it is, it was published in 2018 and the author is James Clark. So if you Google um, Clark and periodization of exercise induces long-term weight loss. So Clark periodization of exercise induces long-term weight loss. Then you just Google that. It should be the first search result. And oh, the reduction of total body weight was 35%. That was the average reduction of total body mass. And it was a two-year study. It was a, it was a two-year study, but it doesn't matter. That is tremendous. Yeah. And the protein was set um, at 1.5 or 1.6 or one, somewhere between 1.5 and 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight. So adequate protein. They capped carbohydrates off at, I think, 100 grams a day. Yeah. Um, and those were the only dietary guidelines that the the subjects had to really follow. So it sort of forced them into this hypocaloric mode. Uh, but then, hey, don't, don't specifically assign, don't get on the scale. Let's focus on improving your lifts here and your endurance there. Uh, and then they dragged it out for two years and lost on an average of 35% of starting body weight, which is really spectacular. That is phenomenal because I, I, you know, I did my master's looking at childhood obesity and, and well, this was like, many years ago. I remember looking at the weight loss literature and, and continue obviously to be interested in it. And I'm constantly amazed that you get people who fall into the overweight and obese category and they follow a very sort of structured approach for 14, 16 weeks and like they lose 1.2 kilos, you know, and it's like, yeah. How on earth do, how, how does it even happen? Like, and it might be a significant finding with regards to the statistics of the study, but certainly yeah. doesn't seem meaningful the way that you've just described this, this study has. And I'll put that study in the show notes too for anyone listening. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just, it really opened my eyes to just the approach of shifting the goal. You know, 
people are psychologically fatigued. They're tired of, of focusing on the scale. Just shift the goal to performance, shift the goal to something else other than weight loss in weight loss uh, clients or patients. And so uh, that was that was definitely an, an eye opener. For sure. And, you know, Alan, I talk a lot to my clients about protein because I where I see, and I'm sure, um, and I've heard you speak on other podcasts and, and I hear a lot of people talk about this idea that, um, you know, people actually don't consume protein in the amounts that are important, I think, for, you know, not only uh, muscle protein synthesis, but regulation of appetite and um, evenness of blood sugar and mood and, and everything. So we focus on sort of the opportunities to increase protein more so than that you have to restrict other other things. Uh, you mentioned with that particular study, 1.5 grams, 1.6 grams per kg per body weight mm -hmm. per day. What yes. are your recommendations in and around protein for your clients or the people you will not so much anymore, but in your book, for example? Yes, I will get to the protein question. I, w I wanted to talk about, because you, you mentioned something about weight loss rates and these dismal results that, yes. that we always see and these really disheartening, discouraging statistics of just how few people lose like a mere, you know, 5% of their starting body weight and then, you know, gain it back. Like there's this really, really terrible, uh, success rate amongst, um, long-term weight loss and, and dieters who, um, I'm trying to think of the actual publication. I, I can't recall it off the top, but apparently only 20% of individuals who lose a substantial amount of weight and it might maybe the you know between that five to ten percent benchmark uh, actually end up keeping it off, and the other eighty percent gain it back. Um, and so this statistic leads a lot of people to conclude that dieting doesn't work, you know. And so this sort of whole culture, this anti-diet culture, is based on these these really terrible um these really dismal success rates with dieting in in the literature but something that people don't realize is that a lot of these failed weight loss attempts are based on these sort of institutionalized programs where people are put where women are put on a 1200 calorie diet this cookie cut 1200 calorie diet men are put on a 1500 calorie diet and then they're just cut loose there's no um there's there's no ongoing programming there's no exercise program there's certainly no structured resistance training program and there's certainly no element that calls for sufficient protein to support the resistance training to support lean body mass while you're losing fat mass so there's really none of those crucial things it's just 1200 calories for you 1500 calories for you okay good luck Stick to it as long as you can. And sure enough, 80% of the people fail on that. And why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they fail on, on something so inadequate in terms of covering what needs to be covered? So I just wanted to get that <laughs> I hope to get that out of the way. Now that we're talking about protein. Um, no, that's good. Yes, the general population, at least in the U.S., and it's, this is probably pretty standard throughout the world, um, habitual protein intakes are right around 1%. 0.0 grams per kilogram, 1.0 gram per kilogram of body weight. And um, it's it ranges like 0.9 to 1.1, 1.1 grams per kilogram of body weight. That's just kind of the average protein intake of the general public in the developed world. And we have a ton of data across all states of energy balance showing that this amount is somewhere between suboptimal to just flat out insufficient for preserving lean body mass and optimizing health outcomes. And uh, the, one of the big overarching problems with protein intake is that the official guidelines, the RDA of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is too low. It's too low for the elderly. 
It's too low for people in hypocaloric or dieting conditions. It's too low for people in exercising conditions. Um, and the, the way that we know this is because there are a multitude of studies that have compared 0.8 grams per kilogram or around there all the way up to even, you know, 1.2. You compare that with amounts, so roughly double that. And in the majority of studies, the vast majority of studies, uh, double the RDA always outperforms the RDA in terms of body composition improvement uh, and or improvement of um, clinical indexes, even things like uh, blood lipid profile, even things like um, glucose control. And so there's a pretty clear, um, pretty clear picture that we need to raise the RDA by at least 50%, at least, and maybe even more optimally, just encourage people to have roughly double the RDA. And then you cover all of the bases that would benefit all of these populations, dieting people, the elderly and exercising folks. And so when you're when you're in that zone of like 1.6 ish grams of protein uh, per kilogram of body weight, which is 0.7 grams per pound. And we always prescribe protein in terms of target body weight or goal body weight. Unless your yeah. current body weight is your goal, then you can do it on current body weight. But yeah. um, 0.7 grams per pound of target body weight, then you're covering your bases in terms of what we know optimizes both um, athletic performance outcomes, body composition outcomes, and health outcomes um, regarding yeah. protein intake. Yeah. Any problems in going higher, Alan? Um, that's a great question because some people would debate me on uh, where the cutoff point is that protein benefits increases in satiety. So there was um, a recent study by uh, Menno Henselmans and, and his group looking at 1.8 versus uh, roughly roughly double that or, or right around 3, 3 point, a little over 3.0 grams per kilogram, I believe. Um, and... The three point uh, three plus grams per kilogram of body weight, it just marginally improved satiety. So it lowered like hunger and desire to eat by by just a little bit compared to the one point eight to a point where they kind of dismissed that advantage and said, well, one point eight is good enough for maximizing satiety. Um, other folks may be worried about effects on kidney and bone. But uh, Joey Antonio's group looked at the bone question, and they've, they've got a great uh, study. Uh, the, tutty, the, the, the title of the study is something along the lines of, is protein bad to the uh, high protein, is it bad to the bone? Something, something cute and, and cheeky like that. And in fact, they, they didn't find any evidence of that. And there's a series of studies out of Joey Antonio's lab um, that show no ill effects on a range of clinical parameters, on kidney health, on liver health, on bone health, the things that people are usually worried about with higher protein intakes. And they looked at amounts up to two to even a little over three grams uh, per kilogram of body weight. And so you're looking at amounts that, gosh, are like three times the RDA. Uh, you know, sometimes four times the RDA. Uh, there's a meta-analysis done by Stu Phillips and colleagues looking at um, the impact of high protein intakes and kidney and kidney health. And I believe Devery's was the uh, lead on that study. And I'll, I'll find it for you in a second. All right, so this was a 2018 meta-analysis, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And the lead author is Michaela Devries. So the name is spelled D-E-V-R-I-E-S. And you can just Google Devries and then the first few words of the title, which is changes in kidney function do not differ. 
So you can just search that. Debris and then changes in kidney function do not differ. And then the rest of the title is between healthy adults consuming higher compared with lower or normal protein diets, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And they found that they found no, no ill effects with intakes going all the way up to around um, two grams per kilogram of body weight. I'm not sure if they looked at amounts be above, above and beyond that, but um, they, they didn't find any reason, any cause for concern uh, with protein intakes that are common to people who eat high protein diets in the 1.6 to 2.2 ish range. And so that's, that's another bit of evidence that people who believe that high protein diets harm the healthy kidney, this is a, a, a stiff challenge to that belief. Yes. And yet it still pervades a lot of the health professionals sort of out there thinking about protein intakes with regards to talking to their clients or talking to their patients. And then, of course, you've got the people who set the recommended dietary allowances or intakes here in New Zealand for protein absolutely not budging on that 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight despite experts like you like Stu Phillips Don Lehman like the the people who do the research in the field clearly stating that that is um a lot lower than what we potentially know is important for health so what are your thoughts Alan yeah. why why do you think this isn't changing wow i i am so stumped as to why we're on year 43 since the 1980 publication. Well, we will be in January since the publication of the, the RDA for protein in 1980. And um, I don't know. I, I, I've, I've bounced this question off other folks, and some people will take the conspiracy, conspiracy theory route and say, hey, uh, well, doesn't do big pharma any good <laughs> if we were to eat yeah. better <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and i'm like yeah. well i never believe these these conspiracy theorists guys but maybe with protein i should start i should start believing them <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe um alan i do have a few um sort of extra questions but i'm really keen to get your insight or perspective on if that's okay with you um sure. the first the first one is a calorie cycling and how useful or otherwise this could be to people who are, again, for fat loss, wanting to uh, add an element of that to their plan or diet breaks. Like, what are your thoughts on these, these two sort of uh, measures? Calorie cycling is a, is a useful approach for people who um, are consuming a, a low total daily amount of carbohydrate. So um, with calorie cycling, it, you can really use carbohydrate as the, the vehicle to manipulate in order to, to achieve this kind of like nonlinear intake. So I want to make it first clear that there's no actual physiological or metabolic advantage to calorie cycling. The main advantages would be psychological and the main advantages would be um, the dieter feeling like they're not dieting every day <laughs> in the course of a week so they may feel like they're dieting for half the week that's a whole lot easier than feeling like they're just grinding and, and pulling their you know gnashing of teeth all seven days a week so um so it's more of a psychological benefit and there there have been people who speculated about uh, carb refeeds, raising leptin and thus, you know, raising energy expenditure for that time. But A, it's a transient um, increase in leptin and energy expenditure and B, the sheer amount of <laughs> energy intake that you're doing on those days that you're raising metabolic rate is going to well offset um, those increases in energy expenditure. So you don't get a net magical um, calorie burn from uh, the leptin mediated effects of carb refeeds that's that's just a a misconception but there are ways that uh that you can 
non-linearized carbohydrate. And I, I'm, I want to make sure I, I get these numbers right. So I don't dish out. I just want to make sure. Okay. So for, let's imagine somebody has a particular carbohydrate amount and I have this all written out on, on something I call the, uh, the non-linear dieting uh, matrix. And, and, and this is, I, I chose a bunch of options for how many times a week you would want to carb up and to what magnitude that you want the carb up to be. But yeah. in my observations, the most popular ones are just doubling your normal carb amount, either two times a week or three times a week. So if you wanted to calorie cycle or carb cycle, then my, I, I have two formulas that are pretty easy to remember. And this is straight out of the um, nonlinear dieting matrix, which I published in, in the flexible dieting book, but I actually have had it up on seminar PowerPoints, gosh, for the last like, you know, seven, seven ish years, seven, eight years. So whatever amount of carbohydrate gram wise that, that you eat per day, let's just take a round number that's easy for math, like a hundred, like a hundred grams. Okay. So if you wanted to feel the glory of doubling that <laughs> on, on two days a week, um, what you would do is just simply multiply your normal carb intake by 0.6 on the five other days. And then, you know, in, in the case of 100 calories, it would be 60 calories on five days a week. And then, boom, you get to experience what a 200 car gram of, of a carb day feels like two days a week. And, of course, you had to make the sacrifice on the other days. But what you've done is you've kind of non-linearized your normal carb intake. And you've left some room for, who knows, maybe maybe a, um, some, an actual decent pasta dish with some bread that day and, or maybe some pizza and maybe some, something else that you've been avoiding because you have this hundred grams of carb limit. So the other popular carb up scheme, which you can apply this little multiplier to the multiplier is not 0.6 because you want to have three days a week where you double your normal carb intake. All you have to do is multiply that normal carb intake by 0.25 on the other four days a week. And it'll all come out to an average of 100 grams of carbs by the yeah. end of the week. Yeah, amazing. So th those are the, the two little magic multipliers, 0.25 if you want three carb ups a week at double your normal amount. Uh, and so you multiply your other days by 0.25. And then 0.6... If you want to have two days a week where you're eating double the carbs, you just multiply your other days, five days a week by, by um, 0.6. So that's, that's the idea of non-linearizing and carb cycling, at least my own OCD methodical way. So you can maintain your originally targeted amount of carbs and you're not just yeah. going haphazard with it. And, um, what it does, it kind of gives people like either two breaks in the week or three breaks in the week from feeling like they're restricting. And so that's one way to do it. Another way to do the nonlinear dieting or carving up or taking diet breaks, diet breaks, um, are more of a useful tool for people who have a substantial amount of weight to lose. Let's like, let's say somewhere between gosh, like 20 to 50 60 pounds to lose or more. Um, and so in cases like that, you're really looking at um, trying to maintain hypocaloric conditions for like at least half a year. And so that can be a, a major grind if you don't have any diet breaks. And so diet breaks, they serve to alleviate the psychological fatigue of the dieting process. And the way you can institute them is one week auto-regulated at some point in a two-month block. So every four to eight weeks, you can institute seven days where you're, you basically just abandon the rules of the diet in terms of what you're supposed to eat and in terms of very specific amounts and in terms of the level of restriction that you normally apply. So there's a difference between 
seven days of total abandon and YOLO and eat as much as you can and you want versus seven days of just, you know, eating on some days you eat a lot less protein than you normally would and a lot more carbon fat, for example, or on some days where you were supposed to have three servings of vegetables, you you just skip the vegetables <laughs> yeah. for that day, or you just simply are eating at roughly um, maintenance levels instead of dieting levels. And so you're still eating sensibly, but you're not sticking to the laundry list of diet rules that you normally stick to while you're trying to lose weight. You're just taking a break from the diet and you're taking a break from the rules, but you're also staying sensible about not going full YOLO. And when I say full YOLO, it means you only live once and therefore you're, you're really not trying to just gorge and, and binge. You're just lightening up the, the reins a bit. And so if you do that for like that, a one week diet break, you may gain 1%, 2% of your body weight. But um, there's some really interesting research. Uh, I believe the author's name is IDE. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not remembering the author's name, but I'll just des describe the study. So this was a seven day study where subjects were fed a thousand calories above and beyond their maintenance requirements. And it, it was a controlled overfeeding study. And the thousand calories was in the form of whipped cream, the whipping cream. So it wasn't a thousand calories extra of, you know, beans and rice or potatoes or, uh, you know, steak and eggs or something like that. <laughs> It was a thousand calories of whipping cream. And so by the end of the seven days, the subjects only gained about a kilogram of body weight. So about two pounds of total body weight after seven days of eating a thousand calories above and beyond their maintenance needs in the form of whipped cream. And the interesting part about the, the weight that they gained, only half of it was body fat. So they only gained half a kilogram ish of body fat and the other half was actually lean mass, which is pretty interesting. And, and so when you, if you can imagine, that's not the kind of diet break I'm asking people to take, no, you know? And, no. and so the detriment that could happen during your diet break, you, yeah, you may gain a kilogram, but it may actually be at most it'll be a half a kilogram of fat if you do the, the whipping cream thousand calories a day beyond maintenance. So, um, and keep in mind with this particular study, it was done in subjects who were not exercising at all. They were just, just completely sedentary. So if your diet break consists of mostly reasonable foods in just amounts that are not so tightly restricted, and you you know you go outside of the lines a bit more than you normally would but you, you know you you maintain your training routine then certainly you can do better than these subjects in this study who gained a kilogram of body weight with half of it being fat while they didn't exercise and while their caloric surplus was definitely not from ideal uh foods so um the people are really afraid to take a week off the diet they're just petrified of it but when you look at what's been done in, in research it kind of can take some of that fear away yeah no, i agree alan do you feel like with that with that example there where they gained a kilo and 500 grams of it was lean mass so would some of the potential so some of that might be glycogen not necessarily from the whipping cream but from the other sources of food that were in the diet that were able to restock glycogen stores for example yes yeah so i just it's so interesting that 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 was how that sort of partitioned and i was just trying to understand what went on yeah. it it's kind of mind-bending how the I, I wouldn't have predicted that no the, the no. odd thing is that split between lean gain and fat gain with whipping cream but um but who knows there there may be some little bit of magic in uh the constituents of the whipping cream and i'm saying that half kidding and half not because we just don't um, know there, 
Yeah, we just don't know. But there's also research comparing the effects of butter with the effects of cream on blood lipids. And so cream actually, just the regular you know, cream that you put in your coffee, mm-hmm. cream had a neutral effect on blood lipids, whereas uh, butter raised the atherogenic subparticle. So um, the, the researchers also, they attributed it to a component of cream called the milk fat globule membrane. MFGM, milk fat global membrane. And so in the process of making butter, the MFGM is churned out of the food matrix. And so there may be something about the milk fat global membrane within there that has some sort of protective effect or some sort of metabolic magic, who knows. Um, And so, you know, who knows, maybe the the researchers thought that they were really kind of doing doing something um, adverse and extreme by picking whipping cream, but hey, maybe it has a little bit of magic in there. Yeah, maybe. Um, Alan, with with regards to um, my next question and uh, metabolic adaptation, and, you know, we sort of mentioned it earlier on in that people who feel they're weight loss resistant because they're unable to lose weight on very low calories. But then, of course, there is this concept of metabolic adaptation where your physiological processes all sort of downregulate and your energy expenditure does decrease. Like how much of an issue is this for people who are in that weight loss uh, sort of space, would you say? I think it's a significant, I think it's a significant issue. And um, the, the reason it's significant is because it's hard to track the component of energy expenditure that, uh, that decreases. And, oh, and by the way, for, for those who are interested in that, the study, it's by Ott, it's not Ott, it's by O-T-T is the last name of, okay. of the, uh, the researcher. It's OTT. Awesome. And it's in the Journal of Nutrition in 2018. So you can just Google Ott et al. Journal of Nutrition 2018. I'll pop that and in the show it notes should too. Be, it should be the first search result. Yeah, lovely. And okay, so um so yeah, the down regulation of energy expenditure. So there's been a series of uh research that's been done by um, actually by Austin Austin Dorf and and her colleagues looking at the metabolic adaptation question, and they're really not finding any evidence of this significant down regulation of resting energy expenditure. Um, nothing that is outside of what can be predicted from losses in metabolically active tissue in lean body mass. So it turns out to be quite mythical that your resting metabolic rate can just basically shut down just these really creepingly low levels. It just doesn't happen. Now, it can theoretically happen uh, to a significant degree if you just commit to not exercising, if you commit to trying to lose as much muscle as you can while losing weight, then you can achieve um, a significant drops in resting energy expenditure. But if you're training and if your program includes resistance training, and certainly if it's, you know, if it's a progressive resistance training type of program, um, then the only metabolic adaptation that could possibly impact the whole total daily energy expenditure is a drop in your non-exercise energy expenditure. And so dr- drops in non-exercise energy expenditure seem to be the X factor that is really frustrating for people who are wondering why they're they're eating less now, but they're s- still not losing weight. Um, it's entirely possible for people to burn significantly less calories uh, than uh, from non-exercise activity and. This so-called non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT 
um, it comes in many forms and not all of it is conscious movement. A lot of it can be subconscious movement like fidgeting. And, uh, the, you know, when those types of things disappear, you're looking at hundreds of calories a day in some cases. And uh, depending on the lifestyle, either recreational or occupational aspects of the lifestyle, when those experience downshifts into more of a corporate um, type of environment, more of a desk type of environment, like, for example, the shift between college life to office life. Uh, you're looking at hundreds of calories expended um, in your college days that are no longer expended in the sort of the grown up life. And uh, in fact, Levine and his colleagues would report on differences as high as a thousand calories um, of energy expenditure of different between people of the same body size, just depending on on their lifestyle and their and their occupation. And so. Uh, people have to recognize that there are differences in these things. And I actually looked at the research on what, what are the neat shifts as a result of dieting and as a result of uh, actually gaining weight. So so neat goes down by, if I'm recalling this correctly, I can relook at it, by around 300 calories on average when, when, people, lose, uh, when people lose a substantial amount of body weight. Yeah. 300 calories is, is significant. Um, over, over the, especially if you extrapolate it out over months and certainly years. Um, and uh, well, speaking of Levine, he had some really interesting research in the other direction where people who are trying to gain weight, their average ramp up in NEAT was 400-ish calories. So they would just spontaneously move that much more. And so... Um, and in fact, one of the subjects in the group ramped up their non-exercise activity just subconsciously by over 700 calories while in an overfeeding state, overfed state. So it kind of goes in both directions for people who are trying to lose weight as well as people who are trying to gain weight. And so it is that element of non-exercise activity rather than resting energy expenditure that really gets impacted like I said, unless you dedicate yourself to losing oodles of muscle mass. Yeah. Okay. And so would your advice to people in who are, you know, in a fat loss phase, just to be really mindful of incidental activity across the day? Cause it's interesting. I hear some people talk about NEAT and they're like, you can't do anything about NEAT because it's subconscious. And I'm like, well, that might be true, but you can certainly be considerate about getting in extra walks or taking extra steps and actually being more deliberate about stuff like that. Yeah. Yes, you, you can. And it, and it does make quite a difference. Uh, I even have, I even know a few people who have set up a, like in their home and entertainment, like in front of their, their, their TV screens, they'll set up like a treadmill type of thing. <laughs> I haven't gone that far yet. <laughs> but it <laughs> it's, sounds, it's it sounds great. pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Oh, oh um, awesome. And, I'm I'm sorry. I'm so conscious of your time. One last question, and no, we're no done. Worries. No worries. We, we I, I don't have any anything to do for like another four days. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's don't, brilliant. Don't don't worry. Oh, if God. there's if there's questions you've got, I'm I'm ready to answer them. <laughs> awesome, Alan. Um, what I'm seeing a lot more of in that uh, sort of social media space, and I don't know how much time you really spend on social media, to be honest. Um, but is the concept of reverse dieting. In people who are recreational athletes and so the general guts of it is you've dieted for so long and you've trained for so long your metabolism is broken so what we need to do is reverse diet your way out of this so you can eat more calories but not gain a significant amount of weight now what are your thoughts on the reverse dieting story because I know it sort of differs depending on who I talk to and I'd love to hear what you think I think the the success or the positive effects of in quotes reverse dieting really come down to an increase in what's called energy flux. So energy flux, uh, so a low energy flux person would be eating a low amount of calories and moving very little. 
So let's take an extremely low energy flux would be very low energy in and very low energy out. Let's say somebody's bedridden and they're only eating like a thousand calories a day. <laughs> That's very low energy flux. And we, we can go on the other end of the spectrum, very high energy flux where somebody is training, let's say four hours a day <laughs> and they're eating four or 5,000 calories a day, 6,000 calories a day. That's very high energy flux. So um, what's happening with reverse dieting people is that there are just, they just are increasing their energy flux, but still staying at energy equilibrium in terms of calories consumed and calories burned. So there really is, there needs to be alongside this reverse dieting process where people are increasing calories, it, whether they like it or not, if they're able to maintain their body weight, then their increase in calories is happening in lockstep with increases in their energy expenditure through either increases in volume of training or intensity of training, whether it's intensity of load or intensity of effort, and um, or, or a combination of those two. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because um, athletes are high energy flux individuals, like uh, endurance athletes are very high energy flux individuals. Um, golfers are <laughs> low energy flux <laughs> athletes, but the high energy flux athletes are going to adapt to their high energy flux by just being much more... Um, efficient at using at their lean tissues using using the fuels and so i mean that goes all, all the way to like if, if somebody doesn't exercise if somebody tries to lose weight and says i'm just gonna diet and not exercise then they're not going to get the same types of physiological adaptations that happen with exercise and so with exercise you're going to um, increase mitochondrial activity. Okay. So you're going to have greater oxidative capacity of the fuels that are incoming and also the fuels that are, you know, endogenous. And so you're going to be leaner <laughs> if you have greater mitochondrial capacity and you're, uh, there are other morphological changes, structural changes at the musculoskeletal level as well. And you're not going to get any of that if you don't exercise. So high energy flux people get a much greater magnitude of these positive adaptations uh, of exercise than low energy flux people. And so relating this all back to the reverse dieting thing, all you're doing is turning people into high energy flux athletic types when you're claiming, okay, we're reverse dieting now. I'm eating 3000 calories for the first time and maintaining it. Well, it's because you're putting all that power to the ground in terms of training performance and work output. That's yeah. what it is. And, and people might not necessarily be cognizant of that either. Like they just right. suddenly they, they feel more energized because they're eating more and they're able to perform better, but it's they're not sort of linking the two. They're just like, I'm able to maintain my weight at this sort of significantly higher calorie amount. Right. That That is a good point that that they might not even, a lot of people are not aware of that. And that also brings up the potential for there being a positive psychological component to reverse dieting in the sense that you're, you're not restricting. You, you feel like you can finally eat a substantive amount of food. And so that can be very good from a psychological standpoint. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are some virtues with, with, a the in quotes reverse dieting process but i think people have to understand you're really just increasing your energy flux yeah yeah no that makes that makes perfect sense ellen what kind of diet do you follow what's your current sort of diet focus if you currently have one it's kind of a standard healthy diet with um i'm a bit higher on the protein than the norm and it's very even. It's almost iso macro nutritional, almost okay. like equal thirds carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Because I love all the foods, um, and I eat them all. 
<laughs> happily. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so um, I think it's a healthy diet. It covers all of the covers all of the food groups. So if you can think of the food groups as meat or the you know the protein group, fat, fibers, vegetables, starch being basically grains and legumes and tubers, and then milk and milk products and fruit. So it covers all of those groups and it covers a, at least three different kinds of foods within each group. So, um, and I also got protein powder in there to make my protein target hit really easily. Uh, I've been blessed to not have any food intolerances or food allergies, which is good in the sense that I can eat all the foods, but it's bad in the sense that I am just man, I can eat. I have quite an appetite and I have to consciously, if I let my, if I, what I call my inner fat boy come out, I could easily become the outer fat boy, but I, I am conscious yes. of that. And, um, yeah, I, um, that's basically, that's basically how I eat. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's where the, what we were talking about earlier about food portions and learning that stuff when we sort of went through uh, nutrition school, um, the whole kind of volume piece with regards to vegetables, because you can eat a decent amount of food, because I'm similar to you, that I need my satiety signals sort of hit. I can't, I'm, I'm not satisfied if I, regardless of the number of calories, they could be equal, but if it's a tiny amount of food versus a big amount of food, I'd much rather, I'd get much more pleasure out of eating more food on a plate than I would um, a small amount. That's yes. why vegetables are great from that volume perspective. Yes, I, I'm right there with you. And there will be some people who harp about the that, hey, you know, vegetables still have calories and stuff. And you, well, I, I generally, <laughs> un, unless somebody has is truly capable of eating just pounds and pounds of vegetables, I, I, I don't sweat it. It is kind of a free food group, the non-starchy vegetables, as far as my my programming goes. Yeah, I'm absolutely similar, I think. No one ever got fat eating a carrot, regardless of right. what you hear in that keto space about carrots being carbohydrate, mm -hmm. which yep. in definition, sure, but not in any sort of meaningful way, which, you know. Um, Alan, yes. what are you excited about finally now? So obviously you've been in the space for, for many years, um, yet obviously you're still passionate about it. Um, as evidenced by the way that you talk about it, what are you? What's your current sort of attention focused on? Mm, I don't know. E everything. Uh, um, I, I like how people are now more open to listening to what's going on in, in the research world. I think that um, there was a time when it was hard to get people to to actually listen to to what we're doing. But I think that because more and more practitioners and, and people who were, were in, who've been in the trenches who are, are now going into research, which I'm seeing with a lot of my, uh, my followers and my students, um, you know, they were, they were bodybuilding bros at, at some point. I think that a lot of the, the questions that they had as, as trainees in, in the trenches I think a lot of them are being um, rooted out in, in academia now. So there was a time about 10, 15 years ago where a lot of the protocols just didn't really reflect uh, real life, what people were actually doing on the track, in the field, on the court, and, and so um, in the gym, you know, especially. And so now there's there's a lot more of that because a lot more of the, the sort of the younger generation of people have graduated school and then they're going into research and they're actually putting out the research. It's it's re that's really exciting to see. Yeah, yeah, and that is awesome, Ellen. And like me, uh, you know, they've had the likes of you who have been there, done that, and you're so good at translating that science into, you know, language that the layperson can understand and, and, and apply. And I think that's the thing that I really value, both through, you know, your books that you've published, but also, of course, your research review. I think you were like the OG of the research review as well. Um, yes. And 
that's yes. and I do love how you look at recent research, but you also go back into the archives and have a take on you know um, sort of more historical studies. Um, Ellen, you've been so generous. Where can people find you if they're not currently already following you? You can find me on, I guess my largest audience is on Instagram. And so my handle on all the social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, yeah, um, is the Alan Aragon, the Alan Aragon. That's how you can find me on social. And my website is alanaragon.com. And my book, Flexible Dieting, is available everywhere books are sold. So everywhere from Target to Walmart to, you know, Barnes & Noble and all of that stuff, Amazon, um, it's available there. And you mentioned my research review. I'm I'm so happy to hear that you're familiar with that and then you you know what it's about. Um, I actually, in the, the issue that's coming out tomorrow, actually, I'm going to post it tomorrow. Oh, I wrote an article, kind of a lengthy one, that is titled, What's Wrong with the RDA for Protein? Oh. And so I look at its inadequacy in hypocaloric conditions, in eucaloric conditions, and even in hypercaloric conditions, its inferior effects in hypercaloric conditions. And you may be familiar with the Bray study, which um, I, I ended up talking about as well, as well as Joey Antonio's stuff. So um, I'm excited about about that issue coming out. And yeah, that's, that's basically where you can find me, alanaragon.com. And yeah, that's it. That is awesome, Alan, and that you're preaching to the choir here with regards to that protein story. So I'll definitely be looking out for that in my inbox. Um, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's been awesome. You know, Mickey, you are so humble in spite of your achievements. So I'm very impressed, you know. So I, I really appreciate you having me and I really enjoyed the conversation. Alrighty, I know that you would have enjoyed that. So um, feel free to share it on your socials with anyone you feel would be interested and absolutely check out Alan's research review and of course his book, Flexible Dieting. Next week on the podcast, I speak to Dr. Matthew Phillips, neurologist based here in Hamilton, all about the link between neurological disorders and metabolic health. Until then though, you can catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, on Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin, or over on my website, mickeywillardin.com, where you can sign up to my weekly email, you can sign up to any number of my meal plans, or the waitlist for Monday's Matter Shredweary edition, which is coming out on, you guessed it, February or book a one-on-one -on -one consult with me to sort your nutrition as we head into 2023. All right, team, you have a great week and look forward to catching up with you next week.